The daughter of the founder of the Marshall Field Department Store was now the Honourable Mrs George Curzon, future vice Reign of India. Mrs Paget, formerly Minnie Stevens of Boston, was there as Cleopatra in a $6,000 costume ablaze with precious gems. The New York press reported that when she entered, people accustomed to the greatest displays of jewellery in the world gasped with wonder and astonishment. And Consuelo Vanderbilt, Duchess of Marlborough, appeared in the tightly laced costume of a 17th century French diplomat's wife. This, despite being seven months pregnant. Whether the photograph was touched up or not, history does not relate. Faced with the style of these American women, the old English aristocrats were not to be outdone. The Marchioness of Londonderry, who had an immense social position then, came as the Empress Maria Theresa of Austria in this wonderful white satin dress with gold embroidery all down the front and um, the famous Londonderry jewels. An awful lot of them were draped over her imposing uh, décolletage and others of her jewels had been reset into the most marvellous and realistic crown. She looked absolutely wonderful. Costume balls were all the rage then, and some guests went to elaborate lengths to be original, especially in their headgear. Mrs Asquith appeared as an oriental snake charmer complete with a papier-mâché snake on her head. The celebrated New York singer Mrs Ronalds, there as Euterpe, the spirit of music, with notes from Verdi embroidered on her dress, had a diamond lyre in her crown which lit up by means of a tiny battery hidden in her hair. Mrs Talbot's winged Valkyrie helmet gave her a terrible headache, but that was nothing compared to the trouble the Countess of Westmoreland had. As Hebe, goddess of youth, she chose to attach a stuffed eagle to her shoulders. And the hostess herself made a suitably dramatic entrance. She appeared at the head of an oriental procession. The Duchess of Devonshire came as the Queen of Egypt, borne in on a litter, escorted by these glamorous society women uh, got up as oriental slaves with gauze trousers and waving ostrich feather fans. Now, I think most of the people who went were fairly old because all their contemporaries, you see, were in their 60s. And it seems so funny to give a ball to a lot of very old people. There were some young ones, no doubt, but when you look through the book, they mostly look that sort of thing, that sort of age. Terrific. That is of Devonshire's ball. In 1901, the British aristocracy gathered in the capital for Queen Victoria's funeral. And a year later, the aristocracy lost its staunchest defender when Lord Salisbury retired, ending his long reign as leader of the Tories. In the new Edwardian era, Aristocratic society came increasingly under the public gaze. This was the heyday of Ascot, and aristocratic and royal patronage took horse racing to the peak of its popularity. The public came in huge numbers to watch both the racing and the aristocratic owners. Lord Lonsdale spent so much on carriages and horses he was forced to sell four family houses, and such stories of extravagance were not confined to the world of racing. Last Neweth in Anglesey provided one of the most bizarre. The first Marquis of Anglesey, one of the nation's great military heroes, led the cavalry charge at Waterloo. The lesser-known fifth Marquis was not a military man. The fifth Marquis, of course, was an oddity. He died, incidentally, before he was 30. Uh, he may have been illegitimate, we're not at all certain about that. But he, he was a very odd fellow, uh, and he, he was extremely well off because the family was in those days. There was an enormous amount of property and so on. And he spent a very, very large amount of money on clothes, which he loved. I think he had 400 pairs of pyjamas and 300 waistcoats and that sort of thing, most of which were never worn. And uh, he bought all sorts of things funny. But he was mad keen about the theatre. And he started here in what had been the, the big chapel, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, a, a full theatre. 
and he used to pay the uh, famous actors and actresses from London to come and play second to him. Whatever the show, the Marquis himself took the lead. He frequently adapted the script to include his party piece, a solo number called The Butterfly Dance. There is no surviving account of quite what the butterfly dance was. And there's Red Riding Hood. And, of course, at the bottom, in scene four, the Marquis of Agassiz will introduce his snow dance. I wonder what that was like. And then there were other things like this, Miss Brown's Trouble, the Marquis of Anglesey's company, a screamingly funny farcical comedy, um, produced under the personal direction of Mr Alex Keith, who was one of the great people in the theatre at that time. One of his favourite roles was Queen Eleanor, a part which demanded a particularly voluptuous outfit. As the performances and costumes became more and more elaborate, the dancing Marquis spent more and more money. He even took his shows on tour abroad, giving audiences in Berlin and Dresden the chance to enjoy the famous butterfly dance. Naturally, the Marquis chose a woman of real beauty to be his wife. The woman who the fifth Marquis married was my grandmother, Lily, who is the beautiful lady in this rather unusual pastel portrait. She um, was strikingly beautiful, with this wonderful, wonderful Titian red hair and very, very pale skin. While they were on honeymoon in Paris, she, she stopped to admire the window display of the famous jeweller shop called Van Cleef and Arpels. And uh, the highly extravagant Fifth Marquis immediately walked into the shop and bought the entire window display, which would have been lovely for her had he not forced her to sleep wearing all the jewellery. It turned out that he had a complete fetish about jewels. The closest the marriage ever came to consummation was that he would make her pose naked, just covered from top to bottom in jewels, and uh, she had to sleep wearing the jewellery. The marriage only lasted six weeks, and she came you know, running home. I think she had a pretty miserable time, really. <laughs> His theatrical exploits eventually led the Marquis into serious debt. He owed more than £250,000 to various jewellers alone. And in 1904, trustees took over his property to pay off the creditors. When the great Anglesey sales came, which lasted 47 days, uh, the jewellery only made £30,000 or something. It was expected to make £300,000, so that, that was false. But there were hundreds of other things. Uh, clothing on a scale that was unbelievable. He couldn't have worn half of what he bought or anything like half. Press reports of the Anglesey sales detailed with some relish the items on offer and the prices that were paid. Lord Anglesey's coronation robe in crimson velvet with coronet was sold yesterday at Anglesey Castle for £59. An open-work paste dog collar, £5.10. A flexible ditto, £6. And a flexible ditto. And two others, £5.10 and £5.50 respectively, etc., etc. In the end, he lost a lot, yes. Yeah. Just from complete extravagance. <laughs> He's quite a character, wasn't he? <sighs> the dancing Marcus, I love it. <laughs> Such stories only confirmed the growing public view of the aristocracy as profligate and indulgent. In 1906, when Asquith and the Liberals won a landslide victory at the polls, the landowners feared an attack on their interests. It was Lloyd George's 1909 budget which provoked the inevitable showdown. He proposed some modest land taxes to raise money for pensions and the Navy. When the Lords rejected the budget, Lloyd George attacked them without mercy. In a particularly telling phrase, he described the House of Lords as 500 ordinary men chosen accidentally from the unemployed. Now, since the unemployed were regarded by many at the time as being the victims not of circumstance or of the social system, but of their own fecklessness, uh, to describe the House of Lords, this august body, as being a lot of layabouts, like, like the, uh, as, as the unemployed were regarded by many as being, 
This was a, 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 a most savage attack, and it, this, this was deeply resented. The Lord's rejection of Lloyd George's budget led to a two-year constitutional battle over the powers of the Upper House. In a series of bravura speeches, the Chancellor offered a powerful critique of the whole system of land ownership. He said, by what right are 10,000 people owners of the soil in this country and the rest of us trespassers in the land of our birth? That this was powerful stuff. In the so-called Peers versus the People election of 1910, posters went up all over the country ridiculing their lordships. The dukes were depicted as bloated, money-grabbing fools dressed in their coronets and ermine. After two election victories, Lloyd George prevailed over the Lords and his budget was passed. The resulting Parliament Act did not in fact diminish the power of the Upper House much at all, but the aristocracy had suffered an irreversible blow. Its claim to be the governing class was at an end. As the military class, the aristocracy soon had another opportunity to lead the nation from the front. But the Great War dealt another serious blow to aristocratic survival. Losses were disproportionately high among the officers. As a consequence, the aristocracy were to advance into the 1920s and 30s with their ranks drastically depleted. <laughs> 